Good evening, Mother. Good evening, Merle. Good evening, everyone. I met Mark in 1971 when I came to La Terrell shortly after I moved to Colorado Springs. I had read a book, The Brother of the Third Degree, and I read about the White Brotherhood and the retreats. And this fascinated me, and I said to this friend of mine that gave me the book, what is this White Brotherhood? And she said, I don't know, but they say, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. So I said, well, you tell the student, to, the teacher, to show his face, would you? <laughs> so I moved to Colorado Springs, and about a few weeks later, she called me from Minneapolis and said, I heard about the White Brotherhood. It's called the Summit Lighthouse. It's in Colorado Springs. Call this number and talk to Elizabeth Clare Prophet. So I called the number and I said, I want to speak to Elizabeth Clare Prophet. <laughs> so somebody got mother on the phone and I said, I'm looking for the White Brotherhood. <laughs> she said, well, come to the meeting Sunday night. So I went to the, went to the Sunday night meeting and there was Mark. And someone took me into the a sanctuary and I, they were singing the great central sun during the sacred ritual and I started singing this with him and I'm looking at this man and I said well he's an ordinary sort of a guy and then he started talking and that changed my mind <laughs> but we always look forward to going to the Sunday evening lectures the Sunday evening services he always had a message for us. But he would pull things on us. And he always, he always knew what to do at the right time. One evening, he started his service, his lecture. Suddenly he stopped and said, let's sing a song. So we sang the song and three people in the front row got up and walked out. He said, uh, now, that, now that that's taken care of, Let's go back to the service. <laughs> he said, you know, these people didn't want to be here, and I had to find a way to let them leave graciously. <laughs> That's the way he would do it. <clears throat> we always enjoyed his, uh, his fireside chats. After the service, we would, we would sit in the family room, and he would ask, answer questions. And this was a great time. And he would just, just talk and answer every question, and it was the greatest time in the world. I remember one time after a service, this was on a Wednesday evening, uh, I happened to be down the, downstairs with a couple of other people, and it was 20 below zero outside. We'd had a lot of snow and this cold weather was just persistent. And he said, uh, oh, this is going to stop. He said, I called it off. <laughs> and I hadn't known him very long, and I looked at him, and I said, he's serious. <laughs> the next day it warmed up, and the spring came. <clears throat> but he would, he, would, he would pull these things on you suddenly. But it always seemed to be something he had to say. After a while, uh, Margie started, Margie was my girlfriend at the time, and uh, she started coming. One day he said to me, uh, we would come to the service together quite a lot. He said, you know, that's a pretty nice girl you have there. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, you ought to do something about that. <laughs> so when we decided to get married, he thought that was really neat. <laughs> he said, uh, Florence told him, he said, do you think they'll let me marry him? And when we had the, when we were married, he said, he thought that was the neatest thing. He really got a big kick out of that. But, <clears throat> we, 
when he ascended, he was still around. And the experience of his ascension, the experience of it all was, was something one could never forget. A few days before he ascended, this was on a Wednesday, I was downstairs and I used to go down and treat the staff sometimes on a Wednesday afternoon. He walked in and he talked for a little while and then shook my hand and said, well, it was good to talk to you. And he walked out and I th something said, sound like he said goodbye. And the following Monday he ascended. And then I realized what, what had taken place there. To tell you about my experience with Lonello after he ascended, one day I was called in James, McCaff James McCaffrey's office uh, on some issue, and I said, well, I better talk to Mother about this and to get this whole issue straightened out. And he said, uh, I he said well, call her. I said, you know how easy it is to call Mother and get her to get through and so forth. And I said, he said, well, Lonello's always around. I thought about that a minute and I said, yeah, that's true. So I walked down to the Grail at Camelot. I knelt in front of the bust that we have back here now of Lonello and I said, Lonello, I've got to talk to Mother. I need your help. And I explained the situation and went on my way. That was a Sunday afternoon. I went to the office the next day and I thought, now just at the right time, Lonella will tell me when to call her. So about 11 o'clock in the morning, the secretary said, the mother's on the phone. So I talked to her for a minute about something she wanted to ask me and then she said, by the way, did you want to talk to me? <laughs> I said, matter of fact, I was just going to call you. <laughs> but. <clears throat> One more time, something happened regarding my office situation. I was practicing at the time in Pasadena on a Saturday afternoon, and I said, well, I've got to call Mother and get this straightened out. So I tried, and without success, I couldn't get through the secretary, so they couldn't put me through or whatever happened. So after the St. Germain service, I went home, and I wrote a letter to Lanello, and I said, Lonello, I've got to talk to Mother. I need your help. I'm asking you to remove all opposition to me getting through to her. I burned the letter and went to bed. The next morning, I woke up at 7 o'clock. This voice said, call Mother. I said, what? I said, call Mother. And the old carnal mind said, I'll bet you're just sitting there at the phone waiting for you to call. And the voice said, well, you wrote the letter, didn't you? So I called, and the secretary said, well, she hasn't turned on her phones yet, but I'll let her know. And, and as soon as she does, you just wait there. So about 10 minutes later, the phone rang. She said, uh, Mother will talk to you now. So I talked to her about three minutes, and we resolved the issue. And she said, I can't talk any longer. I've got to catch a plane. I'm, out, I'm on my way out the door. That taught me what we knew when, Lala, when Mark was around. When he spoke to you, listen. If I hadn't listened to him, I would have missed it, and things would have been a lot different. That was my experience with Mark. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Andrea Celesto. I'm a Montessori preschool teacher here at the ranch, and I have been in the teachings for 14 years. I've been a student of the masters. I would like to witness to my inner life and my inner tie to Lanello versus my outer life and the events that brought me to Summit University in fall of 1981, which was Kwan Yin's quarter. I lived in Chicago as a clothing buyer by profession, 
and I was between jobs in March of 1981. A friend of mine, Carol, who was a keeper of the flame, said to me, well, since you're between jobs, why don't you apply to some university? It's a spiritual university. I was Catholic at the time, and I had a real deep love for God, so I was kind of open to this suggestion. I said, OK. You know, I said, how do I get an application? And um, she said, I'll get one for you. Now, for those of you that are in the field, I'm giving you hope, because I did not decree. I wasn't a keeper of the flame, and I hadn't attended any service. My only real contact was hearing Mother once when she lectured in Chicago in 1980, the year before. I really wanted to learn more about God, so I filled out this application and sent it off, but I kind of said, I doubt that I'll ever go there. Well, within a week, I accepted my dream job. It was the perfect job, and I began working. Um, when I saw Carol, she said, well, Andrea, what happened to your idea about going to Summit University? And I said, well, not, not this year. I said, I really am happy with my job. This is the greatest job. And I said, I don't think I'll be going. So in parting, Carol gave me a two cassette album, Linella's Discourses Number One. I actually hadn't even heard of Linella, but for some reason, I took this album in my car. It was a company car, and I played it constantly. Um, it was the only tape I had, but I had such a, a feeling every time I played it. I loved the sound of Linello's voice, and it was like I could really feel him. I'd be driving, and I'd put that tape on, and it was like he was right there with me. So I didn't always understand what he said. I can remember hearing about the Antikoran of life, and I said, in the web of life in the Antikoran, and I go, the web of life in the Antikoran, I go, I really like the sound of that, and it was just the way he said it and everything about his voice. So I played these tapes repeatedly over the next five months. Everything moved on as usual until one day I was returning from work and I put on my phone answering service and there was a message that I'd been accepted to some university. And it started next month. Now here's how all of heaven and Lanello truly worked for my soul. Two weeks had passed and it was the end of August. I was sitting at my office desk working on an ad. My boss came in and he said, Andrea, plan to go to New York on Sunday. And this voice, this voice said, I don't think so. But I actually turned around to look who said it. <laughs> I mean, I know it came out of my voice, but I, out of my mouth, rather. But I, I didn't really know what, what was happening. My boss's client kind of floored, and he stood there, and he, he said, well, I have to get this ad you know, in, but when I return, I want to meet with you. I sat at my desk absolutely frozen. I didn't understand why I said this, what was going on. I was really like just saying, how am I ever going to meet with him? I don't know what I'm going to say to him, because I really don't know who said that. <laughs> so three hours later, he returned, and I stood before him in his office. And he said to me, when I interviewed you five months ago, you told me you didn't do drugs. I thought that was kind of funny, because he probably thought I had flipped out. <laughs> he, he also said to me, you said that you could make a commitment to this job. Now tell me what is going on. I then heard myself say, I don't know. Perhaps a part of me really wants to go to the spiritual university. I said, I've been accepted, and it starts next week. When I look back at it, my boss was most kind because he told me to go home and think about all of this and have an answer for him in the morning. Now, on the outer, I had no intention of quitting my $40,000 a year job. <laughs> and 15 years ago, that was good money. I just, you know, there wasn't even a question. In that, that morning, when I'm driving to work, I played my Lanello tape. And then for some reason, I put the tapes in the cassette album and took it with me. Now it's been in that car for five months. I've never taken that tape out of the car. And I took it into the office, and then there was the meeting. <laughs> so it was a great surprise to me what happened at this meeting, because my boss called me in, and I go, 
Well, here are the keys to the company car. Here are my business charge cards. Here's my expense money. I said, and um, will you give me a three month leave of absence? He was so shocked. He said, absolutely not. But believe me, at that time, I was shocked too. <laughs> but today, I'd just like to witness to all of you that it was truly Lanello, the love of Lanello, and, and really the works of heaven that brought me to Summit University that next week. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Maria Skopel. I work at the Office of Ministry since 1991. I have been in the teachings since 1996. I'm delighted to share with you a story, just a little vignette, that is very endearing to me. It is a testimony to our beloved Lanello, who is known as our ever-present guru. I call him our everyday guru. Lanello has become to me at the father who loves his children. And so my first experience I had with Lanello was a deep heart contact. The moment I heard his voice during the Jesus ritual with this beautiful rendition of the poetic prayer, it is finished. His voice touched me so deeply and my inner child cried out, this is the father I have longed for for so long. Ever since, Nanello has become the father which my father could not be to me. My earthly father could not be. My friend Judy introduced me to one of these fatherly aspects of Lanello on our first trip together as we traveled through Canada for a visit to Banff. In the parking lot near the Radium Hot Springs, Judy suggested that we make a call to Lanello and ask him to guide us to a restaurant that serves decent food. <laughs> <laughs> the night before, the meal was rather mediocre and the waitress was not of the friendly kind. <laughs> well, I replied, no, 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 we cannot do this. The sent master we cannot ask the ascended master for such trivial stuff. At that time I was pretty new at the teachings. <laughs> Judy immediately set me straight and told me how lovingly Lanello always takes care of his staff. When they go on stump, they never have to worry about food. They never have to worry about lodging or any such thing. They just call on to him in the morning and he provides for them. So, reluctantly and still a little embarrassed and bashful, I agreed to ask Lanello for his assistance. But Judy, I said, you have to begin. I cannot make this call on my own. <laughs> so she said, in the name of my, our holy Christ self, beloved Lanello, we call unto you to provide some decent food for us tonight. Now we were standing in a parking lot, mind you. <laughs> she says, I really feel like having Chinese stir fried. I haven't had it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and in a nice place with no smoking and at a reasonable price. Okay, I said, and beloved Lanello, I would like to have fresh fish if possible. Also, could we have some nice classical music? And as an afterthought, a friendly waiter or waitress. <laughs> and we close Lanello, thanking him for his love that he gives so freely to his chillers. Well, later that evening, he came to Lake Louise and checked in in a hotel and asked for recommendation for a place to eat. The receptionist sent us to a Chinese, Japanese restaurant, which was located in a small shopping center in the center of town. The restaurant was beautifully decorated. As you may guess by now, Judy got her Chinese food <laughs> and I got my fresh fish. And the waiter was the most charming young man with whom we engaged in a very friendly conversation. He was born in Germany, which was of course delightful to me since I'm a native German. 
But suddenly Judy says, Maria, do you hear what I hear? And I said, yes, yeah, some beautiful music. She says, it is green sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> and explained to me, I didn't know at that time, that green sleeves is Lanella's musical keynote for his etheric retreat, which is over being in a mine in Germany. Well, you can imagine what amazement this enkindled in me. <laughs> Not only did our ever present guru, as, or as I call him, our everyday guru, provide us with a wonderful meal, he crowned us with his humorous magic. So the moral of this little vignette is, no matter how trivial your needs seem to you, Lanelle is always only a call away. Perhaps you would like to come to Summit University this summer and can't see how you can do it. Just call Antu Lanello and see how he will answer you. Good evening, Mother. Good evening. I joined the activity in 1971. I'd been on a search, I suppose, for 10 years at that time. And I feel that despite the fact that I was searching, that I was being led. For all of my striving, and for all of the sweat and the aspiration that I would focus on reading these different things and trying to meet people who are interesting, I realized that the masters were guiding me. And I feel that my path has been that way ever since. That though according to my poor capacity I do strive, at the same time the strength of the masters to carry me along and to bring me forward and to make me stronger so that I may take a another step and another step is greater even than my own determination to move forward. Their determination to have me move forward gives me the strength to exercise my determination. When I first came into the teachings, and this happens to many people, there is a kind of a test that comes, a little mixture of our own karma and the plots of the force, I guess they like to say conspire to provide something that will challenge you wherever there's a point of weakness. So I guess I probably had sort of a, uh, a hidden shame-based consciousness at the time, and so uh, some business and social acquaintances and circumstances conspired to make me feel shamed, and that perhaps I wasn't really worthy or ready to be on the path. Nonetheless, I continued to come, and I walked over to the Santa Barbara Focus one day, and Mark was sitting there at a table with four or five fellows in the library. And I pulled up a chair, not really feeling that, a feeling like I was like the smallest of everyone who was there. And maybe not even, maybe I shouldn't even really be there. But Mark pulled up a book that had just been published. It was called A Message of Gentle Unfolding Love. And he simply picked up the book, and he turned to me, and he began to read it. Now, I had already read the book, and I thought it was very sweet and very beautiful. But when Mark read that book, he poured his heart and his being into it, and it flooded me, and it flooded my soul. And I can't say that the, that the sense of being smaller was exactly dispersed. But I would say rather that his love was strengthening. And I understood that I did have my own karma. And I understood that there were people who were far ahead of me on the path. And I understood that they loved me and that they were working on the inner for me to also step forward and make progress on the path. So I think it's what St. Paul would call edifying. Mark's love was strengthening. There wasn't a drop of sympathy in it. He didn't say, oh, poor boy, you had these little problems. 
That wasn't it. But as I stood there and received, the, as I sat there at the table and received this love from Mark, I realized that I was going to be able to continue. I would be able to move on. I would be accepted, not for any more or any less than I was, but that where I was, I was accepted and I would be allowed to move on. That, I think, is the single quality in these teachings that I most love. There's not sympathy, but there is love. If I have an aspiration, it is the aspiration to allow my heart to be purified and strengthened and accelerated to the point where I can also share with others that love that makes the world go round, that love that holds the universes together, and that love that can hold a little soul in pain together until that soul is strong enough to move forward on its own path. When I first came to work, I was working at the Four Winds Organic Restaurant when I came to work on staff in Colorado Springs. I was working at the pots and pans station. It was at night and it was after a long day, it was ten, about 10.15, 10 10.30 at night. And it seemed as I was, I was washing the pots and the pans and the water was sloshing down the drain that I was going down the drain with the water and the grease. <laughs> I was really down in it. And so much so that I was actually leaning over, leaning over, doing the pots and pans. Now, I could feel that Mark had walked into the building because he had a very strong, beautiful aura and you could always feel that. And usually I'd kind of perk up and I'd say, oh, Mark's here. And this time I just, said, I just kept, I said, well, Mark's here. You know. So that, uh, all of a sudden I felt this very strong presence next to me and I kind of looked up and there was Mark in his full, full stature just looking down at me as I was looking up from the sink. So I, I stood up and I said, hi Mark. And he looked at me and he went, rah, 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 rah. And of course, I, I laughed, I was I, and he says, now let that be a lesson to you, young man. Don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> now, I was amazed, not because, he was, not because he exercised a humorous approach for the delivery of his love to me that evening, but I was amazed because I recognized him as being a master of invocation. I'd seen him at the conferences. I'd seen him give dictations from mighty cosmic beings. And I realized that he had more power and more spiritual grace when he was imitating a bark <laughs> than the great pontificating fellows that I had run across in my earlier searches. Mark's an ever-present guru, and he's an ever-humble friend. And that very humility that recognizes God within and God within each one is the most empowering aspect that I have ever seen in anyone, whether they claimed to be powerful of their own or of God. I want to witness about Summit University, too, because at Summit University, you come to a retreat. You're able to leave the world behind for eight or 12 weeks, and you can bask in the light and the grace of the presence of the Master. Now, this is the presence of the Masters with us. As Alex was saying, they sit in the chair as they walk with us. And it is also the presence that is, presence that is held by the Lamb, by our dear messenger. And I'm grateful for this blending of heaven and earth here at the Mystery School, Maitreya's Mystery School. I remember at the end of the St. Germain's Quarter, which I attended, oh, we were all feeling so high and so grand. So much of our karma had been set aside for a period, and so much of it had been transmuted by the work that we had entered into. And the etheric was tangible. And after we finished this one day where we all sat around and decreed all day, and we went through this marvelous clearance where, uh, and this is a part of every session at Summit University, 
There comes a time of great crescendo of the spiritual work that you and the masters are doing together. And there's a special time for a clearance, for a clearing of the soul. And after we had finished that in our class of going through this, we were leaving and, and shaking hands with Mother. And as I walked up, I could see St. Germain where Mother was. And as Mother spoke and she said, that was some great decreeing, I could see that St. Germain was speaking with her. And I said, well, you're my teacher. And she simply smiled, he simply smiled. But as we shook hands, I could feel the hand of St. Germain. Now, this kind of tangible presence of heaven is what Summit University and these teachings and this path is all about. Our goal is to build, to help build, to help anchor that spiritual great golden age of St. Germain so that the time will come again when the masters walk with us on the streets of our cities. And this tangible presence, this union, this oneness of the Holy Spirit present in the sons and daughters of God, in their flesh and their blood, is the future that I look forward to because of what Lanello laid down for us, what Mother sustains for us, and what we have the opportunity to pick up as the gifts and the graces that the Holy Spirit gives to us. So I hope that you will take advantage of the opportunity to come to Summit University. It was one of the highest moments of my life. It's 20-some years later, I guess, about now. And I'm still striving to return to that place where the Masters gave us a moment in time and space to dwell in heaven. And now I know that by following the path and continuing, as we all may do, that heaven can be where we walk. Now I'm not there yet. I don't see the Masters in a daily walk at all yet. But I'm feeling their presence more and more. More and more I'm sustaining the own, my own inner path. More and more there's a surrender unto the grace that is held for us. So I welcome you to come to Summit University to apply yourself with your heart and your soul and to climb to a higher point in the mountain than you've probably been in this life at least, maybe many, 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 many lifetimes. And then you will have the tangible experience that you can take with you on your path of how heaven may dwell on earth where you are. Mark is inspiring. Mark is empowering. And I hope that his love will move through you for those who will look to you for their path. Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Patrick. Hello, Mother. Hello, everyone. My name is Frederick Peck, and I serve here on staff in the Farm and Ranch Department. This time of year is always an exciting time for us because uh, we work with the cattle, and uh, the cattle start having their calves in February, normally. So it's a time of year that we often need help and divine intercession, and when we feel particularly close to Lanello because his Ascension Day is in February. So I want to share with you a story from 10 years ago when there were not many of us here. The church headquarters was still at Camelot and we were sort of the pioneers at the ranch. There was the farm and ranch department, there was a small construction department and the kitchen and that was about it at the time. And uh, in this particular year, we were uh, checking the cattle at night we do this every year because we have to see if they have any problems in, uh, in birth. And to do that, we need a good flashlight because we need to see what's going on and a good flashlight could mean a difference of life and death with the cattle. So we had a big, a big mag light, one of those big ones that has four D batteries in it and uh, put out a really strong beam. We go out at night, 
we'd check all around, check each cow, see what was happening. And uh, midday, I noticed that the, the batteries were going dead on the light. Of course, this was a concern to me, so we went to the store right away, and they were out of batteries. And we needed this flashlight that night. So uh, we decided that the, the best thing to do was call to Lanello to restore the light. So we made a call to Lanello, and I went out that night and flicked the switch, and there it came on, bright as could be. The day was the 26th. That's why we felt particularly inspired to call to Lanello because we had the light of his ascension mantle on that day. So I thought that was really terrific, and I counted it a miracle in my life. And I went the next day to buy batteries, but first I checked the light, and it was still bright. So I didn't buy the batteries. I went out that night, and the next night, and the next night, and it was six weeks, and the battery never went dead. <laughs> <laughs> so for this and many other miracles, and most especially for the teachings you brought forth, I thank you, beloved Lanello. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Alberta Fredrickson, and I'm very happy to say that I get to live in North Glastonbury. Ten years ago this month, on February 22nd, I became a Keeper of the Flame in Santa Cruz, California. Occasionally, I think about how my life is now, and I like to think about what it might have been like if I had never had the opportunity to be in contact with the teachings of the Ascended Masters or Summit University or Summit Lighthouse. And I owe this opportunity and every blessing that's occurred since then to Mark Prophet, our beloved Lanello. Although I did not have the opportunity to know Mark when he lived among us, I am so grateful that he responded to the call. Mark received the call from God and from the Master El Moria to found the Summit Lighthouse. And because he did, he answered the call we're all here. And so it's profound to me to think about what it would be like if we were not all here. If he had not responded to the call, we would not have the dictations and the published pearls of wisdom. We would not have prophecy to direct and guide us. We would not have the marvelous gift of the violet flame that is really the cosmic eraser to help us undo all those things that we wish we had never done. And we would not have Summit University either. And this is one classroom that your soul really does yearn to get into, even those of you who may have felt that school was not a place you enjoyed. I personally would not have the sense of purpose to my life that I experience now. I might still be wondering, why am I here? And I might be really bewildered by what looks like a really crazy world gone wrong. And I think that sometimes my faith might be fairly shattered by watching what's going on in the world if I didn't have a greater understanding that I gained at Summit University about how God's mercy really works through cosmic law. Summit University was a wonderful experience for me. Another very practical wonder of Summit University is the opportunity to really give up and surrender habit patterns and momentums that you want to get rid of through the clearance process. And I can say to you that there are a couple of troublesome things that I carried with me for a long time that I have been able to surrender by God's grace and by the Master's intervention in these clearances. Almost certainly, I would probably still be in California, although you never know what might happen when you don't respond to the call of the Masters. I left California in December 1988 in response to St. Germain's call to be no longer on these coastlines by the end of that year. And when I left California, 10 months later exactly, the earthquake struck in Santa Cruz and three people were killed approximately 50 yards from where I worked every day. You never know. When I left California, I had an outstanding uh, career position in, in, a, in work in a sacred labor that I love very much. And I came to Montana with no job and basically without the prospect of being able to continue in my chosen profession and in my sacred labor. 
But the Masters and God have literally moved heaven and earth, and through a series of four jobs in six years, God has really returned absolutely everything to me that I thought I had surrendered when I left California, and more, including a comparable, very excellent position as personnel director in the Bozeman School District, which allows me to live in North Glastonbury, and I am so grateful. All this for just answering the call. When I think of where all of us might be if Mark had not answered the call, I can almost feel that cold despair in my heart. But instead, what I know is every day when I get up, I have a purpose. I really do know who I am and why I'm here. And I know that my life has some significance for God and for the world. And the only reason that I have the courage to really think that and to believe it is because Lanello is always with me. And I know he's with me because I call to him. I say, Lanello, be with me and take my hand and hold me fast and do not let me go. And because Lanello always answers the call, I know that he's there. And he holds my hand and he encourages me to answer the call that is given to me. So I say to you, answer the call and come to Summit University. Answer the call and just imagine the, the countless souls who will have renewed opportunity because you, because they know you, and because you know Lanello. So answer the call, and I'll see you at Summer University this summer. Always victory. My name is Robert Beasy, and I work in the construction department. And I first came in contact with the teachings late in 71 and came to my first conference in uh, 1972 in uh, Santa Barbara, at the Mother House in Easter. And that was a very moving experience. To, that was my first uh, contact with, with Mark, with Lanello. And it was, uh, it was a very profound experience. I found it just uh, effervescent with uh, love and understanding and in-depth uh, answers to questions that I had pondered for a long time. And it really uh, was a turning point in my life. And from that day forward, I said, here's a man that I need to follow. And uh, the teachings that he, he had, I knew that this was my path. And so I uh, uh, pursued then my uh, study and uh, followed him on to Colorado Springs, and then eventually uh, worked my way in a position where I was on staff. So I had the blessing of knowing Mark for about 10 months. And I'm going to explain a couple little stories, uh, things that uh, I could remember uh, that I thought uh, characterized Mark Prophet. Now, he was a man of uh, great character. You've all heard these testimonies. And he was also quite a character on the stage of life. Now. One observation that many of us had about the lectures that Mark would give uh, is that he would have an uncanny ability to know exactly what people in the audience needed. Uh, you'd be listening to a lecture, and it would seem like he's making various digressions, and then he would come back to the subject matter. And then afterwards, you would be talking to people who said, wow, you know, I had this burden. This thing was on my heart. It was a problem for me, and Mark knew exactly. Uh, what to say, and he answered my question. Uh, there in the, in the, he would look out at the audience and he would just, just absorb whatever people's problems were. And he provided, through the Holy Spirit, he provided those answers. He was deeply concerned about reaching people. And I remember one time after a Sunday uh, service, he came and sat down at a picnic table where I was in the uh, backyard at La Terrell. And he just leaned over to me and he says, uh, what did you think of that? Was it all right? You know, what do you think of that lecture? And I, I just thought, oh, wow, I was uh, astonished that he would ask me because I was kind of a new guy in the block and I was just one of the guys. And, and uh, I told him, I said, well, you know, it was really something that was profound. This was, it, it had the same kind of meaning, meaning uh, to me as if I had heard something like the Sermon on the Mount. And I told him that. And he was very sincere. And he said, well, I just wanted to be sure that I was uh, getting through to people. And I think that Mark didn't 
necessarily always realize how connected he was to the Holy Spirit because it was just an everyday thing for him. He was, you know, it was natural. It just came so naturally. Um, earlier, uh, Dr. Boma mentioned about the family room gatherings. I thought these were very uh, meaningful to me. Uh, we'd get together sometimes after the service uh, and he would just uh, encourage people to come out with any kind of a question that they had. And it gave him a forum for bringing forth some wonderful teachings. And these are addressed in the sermons for, for a Sabbath evening that we have on tape. <clears throat> I had an experience that was a bit uplifting you know, when I was working down to Four Winds. I worked down there as a baker. And Mark Prophet came in the back door, which was customary. And he came in one morning, and I looked over at him, and. And, and uh, my thoughts were, boy, uh, he, he must really be wiped out because he's been fasting for over a week now. And boy, he must really be wiped out. And uh, he just came over to me and he said, he just walked right up to me and he says, hey, how are you guys doing? I'm feeling great. And he just grabbed a hold of me and he just <laughs> lifted me up. <laughs> All 145 pounds, just practically straight arms. And... Uh, puts me down, he says, and of course, you know, I've been fasting now for over a week, you know. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. He knew how to make a point. Uh, one time I had an experience. I was out by the gatehouse, and uh, I, heard, I heard Mark talking to somebody outside, and, and uh, all of a sudden he just bellows out. He just says, uh, who did this to this pickup truck? Look at this terrible thing. Look at this. Why wasn't I informed? What, what happened here? You know. And um, look, I was inside, and I realized that I was the one who dented the pickup. I was the one who did the damage. And I says, "Uh oh, I better face the music." And uh, I paused for a, uh, I paused for a moment, rather fearfully. And I thought, well, you know, I reported it to Jim McCaffrey, and that was a procedure. So uh, eh, maybe I don't have to go out there. And then uh, <laughs> this, uh, then this light of my conscious, you know, just started going off, and it was probably the mantle of Lanello's presence there. And he says, "It was like this is a test. I repeat, this is a test. You know, <laughs> you know, like the uh, emergency broadcast. You know, <laughs> there I was. So I ran outside. He says, "Okay, I did it. I'm the one. You know." And I explained the whole situation to Mark and. And, of course, I had a lot of anxiety, and he just turned to me with a very gentle, understanding, but firm kind of a voice. And he says, well, well, Beezy, you're just going to have to be more careful. You're just going to have to watch where you're going from now on. And uh, that was it. That was the message I needed. <laughs> and, uh, of course, I breathed a sigh of relief. And... I looked, at, I reflected upon this, and what I realized is that he was very masterful in metering, metering out his words and dispensing the energy that a person needed for their instruction or for their discipline. Uh, he had this, you know, one moment it seemed like the wrath of God was flowing through him, and the next moment he was totally... Uh, in exactly the place that he needed to be to provide you with what you needed to continue on and to grow for your spiritual growth. So I wanted to say that Mark is a person whom I wish everybody could meet. But I believe that we will all have our opportunity if we continue to strive and work our way on the path when we finally do make it. Um, Lanella will be there uh, to shake our hand when we enter the gates of heaven. And I'm very grateful to have had the, had the opportunity to have known him, even if it was for a short time. And I can testify, uh, like many other people, that uh, he hung, he's hung around a long time. He's still here, and his presence grows stronger and stronger as we grow closer to him. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mother. Good evening, Dora. Hi, everyone. 
My name is Dorothy Angleton. I uh, work in uh, Montessori Primary, and I also work in editorial. Um, I've been a student in the Senate Masses 25 years, a little bit over. <laughs> the, what I thought I would tell you is how, he, how Mark impressed me the very first time I met him. It had been a big struggle for me to get to La Tourelle. I was told that I couldn't just go there. I had to be invited. So I was scrounging around trying to find somebody who would invite me. This one lady said, oh, I'll invite you. I've been there before. And I can take you there next summer. And I said, next summer? This is December. I have to go now. And so, you know, it was, it was really hard. And, and finally, I did find somebody. But he wasn't inviting me. He was inviting a friend of mine. I invited myself along. And I got there. The first Sunday night I attended a service there it was in January 1970. Mark was there, and I think we, we missed the sacred ritual because we were hearing a, an introductory tape. And when we got into the chapel, um, I, thought, I thought it was just absolutely lovely. I couldn't, I couldn't quite describe what I was feeling, and I didn't know what, what kind of place this was. But I knew that I was home, and I knew that I, I didn't ever want to be anyplace else. So we sang a few songs, did a few decrees, which seemed very fast to me, but the friend that had brought us said, no, they really slowed down a lot for you. And I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> so anyway, then Mark gave a sermon, and it was a, a glorious sermon. And I just could not get over what 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 a, a magnificent man this was. I had never seen anybody like him. I had never met anyone so, well, first of all, he was a very big man, very, with a powerful build, but you, you got the sense that it was a quiet and a great power <clears throat> that he had. But I was so impressed, I think, with his purity, and it just, it just shone, and, and it was in, in everything about him and his kindness. And there was, there was something else that I couldn't really name. And I thought, well, I guess it's holiness. And it was that. But as I, as I learned a little bit more about the teachings, I, I know now that it was Mark's light. That was this overpowering quality that I, I was seeing and feeling. Later on in the spring, I began to work part-time at La Trail as a typist on Saturdays. And uh, I was invited to staff meetings when they happened on Saturday, and it was such a joy. I, I had never been any, into any meetings like that in my life. It was a total adventure, very instructive. We learned a lot, and it was often very funny. I, he, he would teach by, by bringing up these, these um, people from his childhood, his boyhood, his, his adolescence, and they had the strangest names I had ever heard. I mean, <laughs> Mrs. McGillicuddy is <laughs> very tame. <laughs> it wasn't anything like that. They were really peculiar. But he remembered everything. He remembered every, every situation. And he had always, always a, a situation to, uh, to bring into, the, uh, into the, his story and his, his teaching, which really brought, brought the point home. We never forgot them. But I, it, was, it was a real joy to see him in action with the staff. It was, it was uh, a delight. Then, by June 1971, I was on staff full-time. And my experiences with Mark at La Terrell were basically, you know, he was my teacher, but he was, it was the day-to-day -day living with him that was so, it was such a precious, so, so many precious moments. I mean, just, just cooking some of his food and serving, serving his family and, and taking care of his children. It was, it was such a joy. But <clears throat> I'd like to tell you a little simple example of his, his sensitivity and his, more of his uncanny memory. He asked me one day how, how I found the teachings. And so I said, well, first of all, it was, it was through a woman who had, who had come to one conference. And he said, well, what was her name? And I said, I, I told him his, her name. And, uh, he said, oh, I remember her. She came to a con one meeting of a conference, a July conference, two years ago. And 
Um, she has black hair, pointed features, and she wore a black dress. And I said, Mark, that's exactly how she looks. How can you remember him? Remember her just with one meeting two years ago? I said, you see so many people. He said, oh, it was easy. She sat like this the whole time, and she glared at me. <laughs> so, yeah, he knew that woman. But he was, he was a man of action, always, the time, from the time I, I knew him and from being on staff with him. But he, he was, he's also a master of, of, of action, and he, he doesn't mess around. When, um, <clears throat> I want to tell you about that. Uh, we'll show you this this um, speedy uh, resolution that he he has for many situations. When he ascended, he told Mother to tell us that that we could write to him if we had a problem, if we needed anything, and he would answer us. He said, "Write the letter, put it in his in climb the highest mountain by his picture, put a focus on top, and he, we would get an answer." So I hadn't, I hadn't really done this since his ascension, but then we got to Santa Barbara, and it was a um, big house and a lot of work, and here I was in the kitchen. I was scrambling to, to get the cooking done, get the serving done, and clean up the dishes, and you know, I was, I was dragging my, my heels. And so I decided, hey, it's time to write to Mark. <laughs> Ran upstairs, scribbled this note, Mark, I need help in the kitchen. Love, Dorothy. And I ran back downstairs, continued my project, and, and, and exactly half hour later, Mother walks in the kitchen and she said, Dorothy, you need help in the kitchen. <laughs> A direct quote from my, my letter to Mark. So um, I accused her of peeking, and she said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I just wrote that to Mark. <laughs> she said, yeah, he doesn't mess around. So... Um, I just wanted you to know that he, he was just a dearest friend and, and always kind. I mean, there were times he had to scold me because I did a lot of, of, of silly things and stupid things, and, and so he would, he would scold me, but his scolding was a very kind, and sometimes, you know, we would, we would have, we had a system of fines for, for various infractions, and in the kitchen, I, I spent quite a, time, a bit of time in the kitchen. I helped, I helped with the cooking. I didn't do all of it, but I helped with, with some. And one time I was making his breakfast, and, and it, was, um, seemed to be, it seemed to me I was, must be the only other person in the whole building because the telephone was ringing off its hook and nobody was answering it. So um, I had his toast in the oven, and I ran to answer the phone, and, and I, when I got back, of course, it was, the smoke was pouring out. And he looks up from his paper and he said, Dorothy, that's a dollar fine. And I said, I know, Mark. And so he went back to his paper, put the next toast in, and, I, and it was just barely in, so it couldn't possibly burn the phone ring again. So, of course, I ran over and answered it, tried to get right really fast, burned again. And I thought, oh, I can't stand this. And so... He's, he looked up from his paper and he said, Dorothy, another fine is two dollars. And I said, I know, Mark. <laughs> and so, you know, each time I, I run in the pantry, throw the toast out the window so it doesn't make a smell, and then run back, put more toast in the oven. And, and I couldn't believe it. I did it again. The telephone rang again. This time it was Mother she was giving me a, something, telling, asking me for something that she wanted me to bring to her, a, a tray. So by the time I got back and I said, <laughs> What's going to happen now? <laughs> so he says, Dorothy, now the fine is five dollars. And I said, I know. And so he said, but Dorothy, I just hate to do that to you. You're such a nice person. <laughs> <laughs> I bet I couldn't take that. <laughs> so I burst into tears. <laughs> I got him his toast. This time I didn't burn it. Then I, got, I scrambled to get mother her, her things, and I went up. And I was still, tears were still pouring down, and I knocked on her door, and she, she opened the door, and she said, what's wrong? And I said, it's your husband. And I said, she said, my husband? <laughs> I said, yes. I said, I don't mind when he scolds me. I don't mind when he finds me. But when he sympathizes, I can't handle it. <laughs> 
just laughed and said, yeah, he does have a big heart. And that's absolutely true. He had a big heart. He still has a big heart. So we loved him so much. Thanks, brother. Thank you, Dorothy.